Good morning, New Holland. <clears throat> Take your Bibles, if you would, and open them to Genesis chapter number 14. I'm in a series called Faith and Blessing, and uh, I knew where I was going uh, every week. Uh, I kind of had this, you know, the Lord just kind of put them all together. But um, I'm going to actually preach uh, Genesis 14, but it's not going to be the the one that I was kind of expecting to preach. I only do this about once a year, and I kind of ask for you to give me grace to do that. Uh, I'm going to preach what the Scripture says to preach, but uh, there's some things that happened this week that um, in our country that are um, really just kind of um, uh, shook me a little bit. And um, Genesis 14 is the first time that we see war in Scripture. It's not the first war, but it's uh, the first time that we hear them talk about it. And uh, when I saw the things that happened in our, our country this week that really just um, threw me for a loop, so to speak, uh, I really just couldn't get away. So what I had planned to do was preach the entire Genesis 14 in one week <clears throat> and really put the emphasis on that part of Genesis 14, the guy that everybody's heard about, nobody knows much about, the guy by the name of Mechizedek. But if you will grant me, uh, I'm going to talk about Mechizedek next Sunday, but today I'm just going to go in a, in a different vein, and it'll probably be a little bit different than what you were kind of expecting from me, but just understand that um, my words and my opinions really don't matter, that this is the Word of God. It is the inspired, infallible, irrefutable, inerrant Word of God. So we can find the strength for today. We can find the answers for today from here. But it's become, it, people have tried to marginalize this, marginalize the Word of God, marginalize what it says about what we're going through. They see it as a, uh, some see it as a history book. Uh, and when it speaks about history, it's always true. Some see it, well, listen, it's not a science book, but when it talks about science, it's true. It's not uh, a philosophy book, but when it talks about philosophy, it's true. When it talks about society, moral truths, it's true. So we don't try to get society to adjust to us. We, as people of God, we adjust to the Word of God, like we sang this morning. You know, He was the Word from the beginning. And the, the, the one who became flesh was the author and the creator that draws us to himself. And that's really what we want to do today. And I'm going to take a little bit of a, of, of a turn, and you'll kind of know uh, as I'm going through this why it was really impressed so much upon my heart. As a matter of fact, yesterday I, I was sitting outside early in the morning, and, and I fought with this. And, and I hope to think that God won and I lost, but uh, hopefully God will be glorified today by what is said and what is done. But all is vain if it's not his word, if it's not his spirit that speaks. And he doesn't draw us to himself. So let's pray now that God would do exactly that. Once again, Lord, I, I thank you for the privilege of being a preacher, preacher of the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, you've always been relevant. You are the only thing that's relevant. You are wise and you are good. And you're the God of love and you draw us to yourself. And Father, I just pray that you will do exactly that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will take your word and amplify it. And Father, as we look not only at your word, but where we as a people are and as a country, Father, I pray that we would repent where we have fallen short. And Lord, where we need to take up the mantle again that you left us with. You are the God of love. You are the God of salvation. You are the God of reconciliation. And I pray, Lord, that you would do that in our midst. And Lord, if there's anyone that is in the building today or watching us online that does not know you yet as God, as Lord, as Savior, the one who can take away our sins, that can make us, give us the righteousness of God that will allow us to go to heaven one day, to be seen by you, to never to leave you in your glory of your heaven, to enjoy everything that, is, that you invented for us, Father, draw us to yourself. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the, the, the first nine verses because in the first nine verses, 
it's describing the story and talking about there were four kings that had taken over and had uh, over the territory of five other kings. And I can't pronounce any of their names. Amen? Say thank you. I won't try to brutalize their names in front of you. But really what we see here is they came in and, and had war. And war is always going to be there, right? Always going to be wars. Always going to be rumors of wars. There, there's always going to be a group of people who want to instill their will over somebody else. Because of greed, because of power, because of control, they're going to always try to come in and conquer someone else so that they can benefit by it. That's always the way that it's been, and that was what was happening here. There were these four kingdoms that had come and allied together, and they had ruled over these others, and for 12 years, they had been taking tribute from them. Whether it was money, we would call it taxes, or whether it was produce, or whether it was a uh, the herds or the flocks or whatever it would be, part of it would go to them simply because they had been conquered before. But there became a year where they grew tired of it and they quit doing that. So the next year, these four kings come together and they're ready to go during the time of wars in the spring of the year to go forward and to battle once again against these five kings. Now these five kings come together and say, we've got a common goal in this. And if we can do more together than what we can do separate, so they came together to fight the battle. And two of the kings that were uh, uh, on the losing side before and what would turn out to be on the losing side of again were two kingdoms called Sodom and Gomorrah. Anybody ever heard of those two cities? You know, you may not understand this fully, but actually... They lost this battle, but word got to a man by the name of Abram about it, and Abram went out because Lot, his nephew, had, was in that territory, and he was taken in, by these other kings. He, his family, all of his goods were taken, and there's only one reason for war in the Bible, only one reason. Now, we know that others will do it, once again, out of greed, won't desire for power and control. But the only reason that we understand that war is, is good and right is self-defense. So Abram went out to fight against them, and he actually defeated them and brought Lot and those back. But let me just talk a little bit about this war that was being waged, and I believe a war that is being waged today. And we have had hot wars in our country and we've had cold wars. I know there's a whole lot of press that's going on today about what China has, is trying to do and has done to the United States of America and what Russia has done and is trying to do in America. And we've been in a cold war before. It seems like we're moving a little bit to that way again. But I want you to know that united we stand, divided we fall, and there's someone behind these things. The prince of darkness. I mean, if there's good and evil, and if God is good all the time and all the time, what? Then Satan is evil. Evil is Satan. And all the time, Satan is evil. And he always hates everything that brings the righteousness of God up to play. Anyone who stands for God. And, and there was a time as a nation that the majority of the people of the United States of America were, had a bent towards serving God. Now, sometimes we say that we're one nation under God, but if you really look at the evidence of it, we're really, really not. The prince of the power of the air seems to be winning. And he's good at what he does. And there are battles that are being waged. Sometimes we give the, the battles from out. Sometimes we give Russia and China too much credit for what we do. But there are other nations that are going on. And, and think about this. Think of the battle of the things that Satan hates and the evidence of what we see of the devastation of the battlefield that's happening in the United States of America today. Let me give you a, an instance. The family. The family. It's being torn apart. And it has been. And it is being torn apart. 
we've grown accustomed to some of these things. Listen, someone was asking me where I stood politically. And I said, I've made up my decision in the early 80s. There was a line in the sand that I would draw that I would never, ever, ever, I have not, nor will I, vote for someone who is for abortion. To me, that's the line in the sand. But today, what we have found, it happened in 73 when Roe versus Wade, and they legalized abortion. But here's the sad fact is, now it has become so inbred in our society that even the Supreme Court says, though it wasn't good law when it was made, we can never go back and redo it because we have grown so accustomed to it. From what I understand, wrong is wrong. Right will always be right, but wrong will ever be wrong, whether we've grown accustomed to it or not. You ever heard the story of the frog in the kettle? If you've got a kettle full of water and you take a frog and that, that water is boiling water and you throw that frog in it, guess what's going to happen? He's going to hop out. But if you throw that, if you get cool water, you put a fire underneath it and you throw the frog in it, he'll swim around in it. But because the water gets hotter and hotter, you'll boil that frog in it. Because he gets adjusted to it over time. Now you haven't heard me get on my soapbox too awful much. But I'm here to tell you because of some of the things that have happened this week that I'm going to stand very proudly on my, on my soapbox and tell you Satan is trying to tell the, tear the family apart. And abortion is one of the ways that he's doing it. He's killing a generation. And we're allowing it to happen. And there's a slow evolving, a slow erosion. There's a slow of, of the morality. He's bringing it in. If he came up and told us flat out and said, we're going to do this in America, we would say no, but it's a gradual thing and how it's come in. And we've come to accept it. Pornography. I looked it up under Google. Between $100 and $200 million in America every year. $100 million on pornography. When I was a kid, we understood pornography as penthouse, or excuse me, playboy, then penthouse, and then hustler, depending on what variety of pornography that you wanted. Maybe you had a friend whose dad had some magazines and he stored them under, the, under his bed and the, the kid would find them one day when he was told to clean something and, and he would sneak it out and his friends would look at it. That's how I was introduced to it. But today, parents and grandparents buy their kids a little thing, it's about this big. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And we do it because we love our kids and we want to keep up with our kids and we trust our kids and we want them to have games and we let them put games on these things and, and, and we, we can keep up with where they are. Really? Because all these kids have to do is push a button and the most vile things that you would never want to enter your children's mind they see on those little phones. And you can't unsee them. And the way that the family is represented is perverted. What God created that was good looks awful evil. And we have come to accept it. Now I know that some people would say this kind of preaching is the kind of preaching you'd hear every now and again. You'd throw some fresh meat out to the audience. Listen, I just preach it as it comes along. But there's a war that's being fought here. And I want you to see this. Look in uh, chapter 14 in verse number 10. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there. And the remainder fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. The, these enemies came in and, and down by the, the salt sea or what we would know as the dead sea, they, they kind of pushed them in a place where there were these asphalt pits where they got stuck. And there they fought against them. You get them stuck in a place. And you can pick them off. I was listening to a pastor, and he was being asked questions. It was a podcast. 
And it, this is a pastor, a very well-known pastor who pastored the same. He started a church in Louisville, Kentucky, pastored the same church for years and years. I believe it was like 45 years he was the pastor of that church. And he was asking now, what, what advice would, would you, the older pastor, what would you give the younger pastor? What advice would you give him? And the very first thing he said was stay away from pornography. Because of how subtle it is and how it can tear apart. You say, oh, this is another one of those sermons. Let me tell you some things, some other things, how he's trying to tear our families apart. We talk about the imports from China, but what about all the imports of drugs from all the places that our children are being introduced? Some of you are older like me, and maybe in middle school, maybe in high school, somebody offered you a beer, and you drank a beer. Maybe you were given a cigarette, and you smoked a cigarette, and you were sneaking behind, you know, and it felt good to sneak around and get those things. And but our middle schoolers are being introduced to heroin and meth. I've been working with people in addiction since 1994. And it tears my heart apart to hear of a middle school child overdosing with heroin, laced with fentanyl, and the first responders having to give them narcol to bring them back. That's happening here. Billions of dollars of drug trade happening here. And they're attacking our children. Homosexuality. Now is they're seeking to, to teach our children in school that this is a normal way of life. LGBTQ, whatever you are, whatever it is, they want to teach our children that that is a normal life, that two dads can have children and two moms can have children. They're trying to tear apart the nuclear family, the entertainment industry in our country. Billions of dollars, untold billions of dollars where the Christian family is seen as outdated and, and doofuses. And me, the white male who is married to one person trying to raise their kids the right way with morality and, and care for what is right, we're seen as the doofuses out there. And that's how we're portrayed. And what kills me is this. Our, our children and the youth, our high school and college age, when they see this, they think it's normal. They, are, they have bought into the lie that God made them that way. And the experimentation of little girls and boys who feel like that they don't fit in any other place so they can go there and fit in. Satan is behind this. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And how long? You see... Because, like the frog in the kettle, it doesn't happen instantly, but it evolves over time. And, and listen, I remember in the church when they was talked about, and all the people would say, amen, amen, good preaching, we're against it. But we've never done anything about it. Sex trafficking. We're making much in our country about slavery that happened over 150 years ago. And it was wrong 150 years ago. But people are, some people are still living over not what they experienced, but what their ancestors experienced over 150 years ago. But sex trafficking, slavery, is happening in America today. In 2014, in Atlanta, $240 million in Atlanta in sex trafficking. The average age of a little girl is 19, average age. Why are we not talking about it? Why is that no longer important to us? These things are being brought to us. 
in the Christian church, you see, we fight battles of us against them. We, I don't care if you're on the politically left or the politically right. I don't care if you're for the old or you're for the young. I don't care if you're in the baby boomers or the Gen Z. I don't care if you've got this uh, message you want to peddle or that pes message you want to peddle. I, I don't care. You know, listen, I'm a factor in it too. I'm a Georgia Bulldog. I hate Georgia Tech. Right? They call it good old-fashioned hate. Where did I get caught up into this? And we don't even look at We just see that as normal, an average, everyday part of life. And united we stand, but divided we fall. And there are some things that are happening to us that have been highlighted, that are scaring me to death. The schools. I know I'm in the preacher voice, and forgive me. My daughter is a school teacher. And when she first became a school teacher, she came and she said, Dad, I'm not supposed to talk about it. And I said, you can't bring it up, but if they ask you the question, you got full rights to tell them whatever is right. You answer their question. But now they're trying to limit that. They're trying to even limit that. Listen, right here, Hall County. I've seen it. I've experienced it right here. The pressure of being that, that there is a small group out there that's making that the normal, and the majority, I believe, the majority are allowing it to happen. What are we going to do? When are we going to take a stand? Can I, can I just uh, take you over to Joshua? I was reading this and when, when, I, when I was thinking about it, I said, Lord, that's a good point. Let me read to you Joshua chapter 5. This is, they're going over into the promised land. Y'all good with that? They're going to fight the battles that are over in the promised land. It came to pass, this is Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Now that'll make your heart beat right there. Here's Joshua, here's the commander, and he looks up, and there's a, there's a soldier standing with the sword drawn. Listen to Joshua. He went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? You on my side, you on their side. You for us, or you for them. Hear the answer. No. I love that. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Y'all hear that? I'm not for you, and I'm not for them. I'm for God. I have not come to side with you. I have come to take over. There is only one person on the throne in heaven, and every knee shall bow and every shung shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the one that we need to bow to and not to anyone else. You see, Satan is attacking the family. Satan is attacking our schools. Satan is attacking our courts. And Satan is attacking the churches. Let me tell you something that happened this week. Well, before I tell you that, can, can I tell you all about this? Have, you, have anybody ever heard of the Constitution? Anybody ever heard of the Constitution? Before you get to the Constitution, there's this thing called the preamble that defines what the Constitution is about. We, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and ensure the blessings of liberty for ourselves, and our posterity, those coming after us. Do ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States of America. Up front, they said, because it's real, because it's right, because it's good, because it's needful, because it's necessary, we ordain this Constitution. Now, as they wrote this Constitution, James Madison and some of the other Federalists came together, and they said, 
great writing, really love it, but there's some things that we probably left out. So they gave us what we call the Bill of Rights, 10 amendments, and the first one says this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. In other words, government's not going to create the religion over us. Or prohibit the free exercise thereof. Government's going to stay out of it. They talk about separation of church and state. The government has to be out of it. They have no right to have any authority over the church according to the First Amendment. It goes on to say, or abridge the freedom of speech. And I'm grateful for the freedom of speech. That gives me the right to stand up here and to preach the Word of God, and, and I have the full freedom to do that. I will tell you that in Texas, wasn't too long ago, this pastor spoke up against homosexuality, and they uh, the, the mayor and others came against him and said, you are not allowed to speak against uh, homosexuality. They called it hate speech, and they said, if you do it again, we're going to throw you in jail. I believe that's against the freedom of speech, is it not? Or of the press. Now, look, I might not agree with everything the press writes, but I'm very grateful we have the freedom of the press, and I hope you are too. Shall not, shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. That's the First Amendment to the Constitution. And yet this week, our Supreme Court, and by the way, if you're looking for the Supreme Court to be the answer to our issues and our problems, you got a problem. There is a throne in heaven that will fight our battles for us. And I know people have talked, on one political side, they say, oh, we need more people like this. And the others on the other political side, oh, we need people like this. This week, our Supreme Court ruled in Calvary Chapel, Dayton Valley, versus Steve uh, Sisolak, the governor of Nevada. Let me, get, let me tell you what this was about. In Nevada, the governor said that in casinos, in restaurants, in gyms, and in um, bowling alleys. Phyllis, you and John, bowling alleys. If, if the fire marshal says that you can put 500 people in there, you get 50%. You can put 50% in. But in churches, you can have 50. It doesn't matter if you're building can hold 500 or 1,000. You can only have 50 people there. Now, since this all began with COVID, you have heard me state it over and over and over again. I want everybody to follow your own conscience and your own heart. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't, we will do social distancing. We will not uh, enter your space. We clean in between services. We've done everything that we know to do so that we can have a clean, healthy, safe environment for everybody to come and worship. That would have been a good place for an amen. amen. All right, just reminding you. But we let everybody vote with their feet. If you felt led to stay home and watch us online, hey guys, bless you. If you want to come, bless you. But the Supreme Court said this week, they stood with the governor of Nevada, hey, we need the money in the casinos in Nevada. So if they can have 5,000 people, fire marshal says they can have 5,000 people, then they can have 2,500 people in there, and there are no, nothing about masks or anything else or anything about social distancing. They can have 50%. But churches... We're only allowed 50. Now, when this came down, now, I'm not being rude when I say this. There are certain on the court that are called, they call themselves liberal, and there are certain ones on the court that call themselves conservative. And our Chief Justice, John Roberts, 
who some would call him conservative, some would call him moderate. He moved to the right and joined with the four liberals to make it a 5-4 decision. Now hear this, and hear this well. The dissenters, usually the ones who are in the majority decision, they tell you the reason why they make their decision. And if you're on the losing side of it, the dissenters, they'll give you a reason for that too. All the ones on the losing side, the dissenters, gave a written statement about why they believed that, that, that the church had the right to have the same equal things that the casinos and the restaurants and the bowling alleys and the gyms got. But for the winning side who said churches are not allowed just 50 people, this is the sentence, one sentence that spoke of their belief. The application for injunctive relief is denied. That's all. No reason why. Denied. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. I have backed our governor 100%. Governor Brian Kemp, is my opinion, has stayed on the right side of this every step of the way. He is the one that when we got the, Mark and I looked at the sentence, the sentence came from him, that we wanted to have a good place, a, a good, safe, healthy place of worship. We stowed the sentence from him. I told y'all I stowed the sentence from him. I back him 100%. By the way, he has made no restriction on churches, not one. He has supported us, and we, in the same vein, have tried to do the right thing every step of the way for your sake and for the sake of everyone else. But in California, there is a lawsuit against Go uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. By the way, he has banned singing in churches. It projects the COVID. You sing. And 32 counties were told that they could not have services. Limited services. Y'all ever heard of a guy by the name of John MacArthur, Pastor John MacArthur? Grace to you, you heard him on the radio. He's a pastor of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. This past Friday, he made a public statement. I want you to hear what he said. He said, therefore, in response to the recent state order requiring churches in California to limit or suspend all meetings indefinitely, we, the pastors and elders of Grace Community Church, respectfully inform our civic leaders that they have exceeded their legitimate jurisdiction and faithfulness to Christ prohibits us from observing the restrictions they want to impose on our corporate worship service. They told him up front, we're going to keep doing it. He went on to say this statement. He said, the biblical order is clear. Christ is Lord over Caesar, not vice versa. Christ, not Caesar, is head of the church. I promise you I was going to get to Genesis 14. Thank you all for listening so quietly. There was a time to take a stand, and Abram did. When those tribes went after it, he went back. Look what it says in verse number 13. Then one who had escaped from came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the temperate tree of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, the brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. In other words, Abram was living at peace with those that were around him. One heard about it, escaped, and came and told Abram. Verse 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed three, his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He said, there's a time of self-defense. I cannot sit back. I have to go. I have to go to war. He was prepared. He had 318 trained servants. He knew that this day would come, and he was prepared. So when he heard about it, he took them and went. 
with a bold leader and an aggressive tact. Look what it says in verse 15. He divided his forces against them by night. He gets there. And the one thing you don't do, if you've only got 318 uh, soldiers, you don't divide them. But he did because it was a very strategic attack at night. Two different flanks. Confusion. 318 defeated four kings with all of their armies. He attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. That's way north. From the Dead Sea all the way up to what we would call today modern-day Syria. He whipped them every step of the way. Verse 16, so he brought back all the goods and brought back his brother Lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. Now, initially, those who went to war, they won. But then when Abram heard about it, he went after it. And he followed the Lord. He trusted in God. Was he outmanned? Absolutely. Absolutely. Y'all ever heard of this guy named Gideon? Gideon's problem was his army was too big. God was looking for a faithful group of people. And in the process, some were eliminated, but some stood up. By the way, John MacArthur, when he made that statement on Friday about how they would continue to hold service, he said this may be the very thing that God is doing to call his church and find the true people of God. Those who are Christians, not because mama said they had to be or they grew up in the South, but they chose to bow a knee before God. He said, this may be the very thing that God is doing. Was it worth risking all? Absolutely. We can't sit back. We can't wait. We can't. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let me remind you something. It's one of my favorite scriptures. I think I could quote it to you, but I want to make sure that I say it absolutely correct. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. I don't care how they battle. We're not going to battle like that. They may battle being rude and mean and deceptive and hard. We're not going to take that tack. Because our, our master that called us said we're the love. We're to do things the right way. He said, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare. By the way, we have weapons. The weapons of the warfare that we fight are not carnal. Not of this world. But they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And Satan's got some strongholds. Casting down arguments. There are some people that are deceived that need the truth. They need someone to lovingly, kindly share the truth. We don't tear them down by slinging more mud than them. We take the high road and we love them in Jesus' name. We put on the armor of God every day. We don't fight with anger and hatred and bitterness. You don't hear me getting up and rallying all the time. But sooner or later, we've got to say, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is shifting sand. We stand on Christ. We stand on the truth of the Word of God. We have been given the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and we must go forward and battle in the way that He wants us to. Listen to what He says. And, and, and exalts itself against every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive into the obedience of God. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking about when the children of Israel were about to go and cross into the, the Jordan River and cross into the Promised Land. And I, I started thinking about Moses. He, he got them together and talked to them before they went over. I want you to hear the Word of God. I think he'll speak it plainly. Y'all listening? For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it or do it? 
nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word of God is very near you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. There's choices to be made. If you want to find evil, you can find it. If you want to choose life and good, you can make that choice. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commandments, His statutes, His judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live and that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life, the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. We need some men to stand up and love their wives again, be the spiritual head of the home. We need some women clothed in truth to love people to Jesus. It may be hard. It may be difficult. You may grow tired. You may grow weary. Under this COVID-19 thing, people are saying, so much has come against us. It's so hard. It's so difficult. We can't meet together the way we want to. We can't do church like we used to. We can't do this. We can't do this. I just need to remind you of something. The places where Christianity is growing the fastest, like China, where you have to join the church that China approves. I have a friend who was in my church. He was in my mentoring group. He went and served in China, taught English in China. You ever hear a Chinese person that sounds like a black person from Atlanta? That's my man, Jeremiah Dukes. He would always guard against, he, he'd tell me, when we conversed, he said, don't mention God. You can say, our Father, because they don't understand that. But he had, to, he had to put it forth in such a way. And if you didn't join their church, you had to do what we would know today as an underground church, an illegal church. And it's the fastest growing around. 250 million is what we're told, Christians in China. I would call it in the worst of circumstances. Maybe we've been too comfortable. Maybe, you know, I grew up Southern Baptist. We had all of our programs. We had all the things that we did and the way that we did them. Lord, we've had, we've had battles. We've had battles in churches. I remember the first time I was, I was when I was in school, I, played a musical instrument, and I was invited to go to a place. And I went to that place, and I thought, they don't worship like we worship. I went to a place where they didn't have instruments. And when they sang, it was a cappella. I thought, oh, my goodness, they sang. I found that we always want to fuss and talk about our denomination. We're good, and they're bad, and all that other kind of Maybe we've gotten too comfortable in what we're doing. We need to get back to 
making sure we're doing what God's called us to do. See, we've got to take the battle. I have, one of the things that blessed my heart the most was in the mid-80s. Mm. I take that back. I believe it was 1990. When Russia was just starting the, in the Cold War, the wall had not fallen. Russia was starting to allow some other things in, and Christians were allowed in. I saw a picture of someone who had gotten saved, and they went to a lake, a frozen lake, and they had to bust through the ice so that someone could be baptized. And they baptized him in a frozen lake. We got a heated pool right back there. We'll bore you like a lobster if you're not careful. We'll make you just as comfortable as comfortable could be. And that may be part of our problem is we have mighty much grown comfortable. That may not be the right way of saying it, but I think you know what I mean. We have let our guard down, and Satan slipped in the back door. We need to stand up, stand up for Jesus. We can't wait. We've got to do it now. We're arguing over things that really don't matter, when the things that do matter, I'm willing to fight for our families. I'm willing to fight for that next generation. I want to make sure that these young people that can bring their children to church, I want to make sure that we take the moral high ground. I don't care what the world does. And if you don't think we're losing the battle, 240 million in 2014 in sex trafficking in Atlanta, fighting for the soul of our kids. God help us. The sleeping giant needs to awaken. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. Lord, I know that all is vain if the Holy Spirit does not take these words and make them true to our heart and our life. Father, I'm not looking for a following. You know that. Lord, my desire, my heart, and my passion is to point people to you. Lord, so that you can be the God of the living, a God of blessing, a God who heals, a God of reconciliation, a God of love. Lord, most of us have so very much. Do we have to lose it all before we awaken? Blow the trumpet, Lord, in our heart. The battle belongs to the Lord. The weapons of our warfare are there. The armor of God is good. Lord, may we not remain silent any longer. Lord, may we not be afraid to sacrifice and give and yield our heart to you and take up the mantle. Give us boldness. Give us courage. Give us a love that can endure. Father, call people back to yourself. If not, God, we're doomed. You're our only hope. Father, love this world through us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.